everyone, I'm John Evans. Welcome to another episode of One on One. Lee Lochnane first picked up the trumpet at the age of 11 in the late 1950s. And about a decade later, he helped launch a brand new sound. Chicago mixed brass instruments with a rock band and became an instant sensation. Since then, their records and songs have been at the top of the charts and are the soundtrack for millions of lives all around the world. Lochnane is one of three members of the Hall of Fame band still touring 52 years after that very first record. And here's the good news for all of us who are Chicago fans. He has no plans to stop playing anytime soon. Well, 54 years after the band formed, Chicago is going to entertain fans at the Live Oak Amphitheater in downtown Wilmington, Tuesday, October the 12th, and we're honored to have one of the founding members of the band, Lee Lochnane, with us. Lee, welcome to the one-on-one -on -one with John Evans podcast. Thank you very much for having me. It's great to be here. Well, I checked your schedule, and you guys are booked solid through October November and the first two thirds of December. How do right. you keep the energy and excitement going, Lee, 52 years now after releasing that very first record? Well, this, this year in particular, we didn't get to start until June because of COVID. I mean, everything has the connotation of COVID on it right now for the entire world. It's, it's amazing how this thing has affected every one of us everywhere. And uh, I'm, to me, this is at the end of it, and we couldn't wait. We were chomping at the bit to get back to work, and it kept getting pushed back to the point where all of a sudden in June, we started working. And uh, we started in Kansas, and we have moved to the East Coast and back to the West Coast, and, and now we're back in the East again. Uh, and the thing that has, has come out is that everyone is so excited to be back with each other again and listening to live music or for that matter just being out and having dinner with your loved ones and being able to feel comfortable doing that and uh, the comfort level is coming back uh, slower than I want it to but I think that there's a lot more factors that are involved with with that comfort zone so what can Chicago fans expect to hear at the show next Tuesday night? Well, we are going to start with introduction. First song, first album. And then we're going to do a cross-section of our entire career through the rest of the night. And it'll be probably uh, uh, two sets, probably take a 20-minute inter intermission, do a, an hour, 20 minutes, and then another hour. And uh, the shows have been going well, and people are very accepting of songs that have been around for a long, long time, and they never get tired of hearing them. So well, I mean, it's great to do it. Being one of those fans, I never get tired of hearing them either. Let me just say that. <laughs> right. Does your song list change from place to place, or once you set it at the start of a tour, do you kind of do the same thing all the way through? With a few exceptions, we do the same thing through the entire tour, and that's because the production is, is at a point now where you can't just willy-nilly decide to change something just before you go on because uh, there are too many production factors that come into it. Everybody has to change and, and inevitably someone doesn't get the message. And then you know, okay, we could have done better with that one. But uh, I mean, you know, from working at a station, if everybody doesn't know exactly what's going on, things get screwed up. Yep. Planning is uh, three quarters of success, as they That's always right. say. Our preparation with uh, painting a house or anything else, the preparation is, is more important than the actual paint. Now, there are three of the founding members still with the band, yourself, Robert Lamb, and uh, James Pankow. And yeah. Walt Parazator left in 2017. How long did it take you to get over maybe not looking across the stage and seeing him after it being you know, 48 or 49 well, years? It, he actually left. It, it was announced that it, he was, you know, officially gone in 2017, but Ray Herman has been with us for 17 years. So Walt had been, because of his health problems, 
has been on the road less and less and less. And 2017 was the final. I'm, I'm not going to be able to come back at all. So he was coming back periodically during that whole time. But Ray Herman has been pretty much our saxophone player for 17 years and uh, does a great job, by the way, too. And, and, and he now, uh, me, Jimmy, and Walter, I was doing an interview uh, uh, for the International Trumpet uh, journal and and um, God, I can't think of the interviewer's name. He's going to kill me. He, he probably already. Me, this is not the first time you've forgotten my name. But <laughs> anyway, <laughs> he mentioned while we were doing the interview that that our section was together longer than any other uh, brass section in the history of music, and I I was like taken aback by that. And when I thought about it, I mean, all these guys that played with the big bands in the 30s and 40s, they would change from one band to the next weekly. You know, there was never any big time length of time that they were with anybody. And, uh, you know, we were already together 35, 40 years when, when we did that. I did that interview. And now myself, James and, and Ray Herman, it's the same thing. We've been together longer than any other uh, section in the history of music. So it's like, that's pretty stunning when you think about it. Is there a comfort level though, in looking over and seeing Robert and looking over and seeing James? Uh, yes. I imagine that must bring you comfort when you're a performer on stage. It's amazing. You know, you have to pinch yourself sometimes that we're actually still able to do this this much time later, but people really want to hear the music that has come through us and it has affected different generations of people in a similar way that it did when it was first written. We had no idea that that would happen when we wrote it. You do know, you it's, it's amazing. Do you still get the same emotions now from your vantage point as you got in 70 and 71, seeing the way the audience responds? Do you get that same kick, that same feeling of satisfaction that what you're doing is enjoyed by so many people? Yeah, initially, I think I think it's more intense now than it than it ever was because we didn't believe it in in the beginning. We didn't think that you know we thought we'd have one album, maybe two, and you know so to be doing our thirty eighth album, recording our thirty eighth album now, it's like that can't happen. That's not going to happen. What are, what are we going to be together for life? Uh, yeah, it looks like it. You know, so we'll see what happens next, but. Uh, doesn't look like we're going to stop anytime soon. Do your songs take you back to specific times? And the reason I say that is whenever I hear If You Leave Me Now, I remember putting the 8-track of Chicago 10 in my 73 Camaro 8-track player and right. driving around town. So some of your songs and other bands' songs take me to specific places. How about right. you? When you play them, do you get taken back to maybe where they were written or where you first heard the melody or the lyrics? Uh, yes, and you're right. It takes for us. It goes rather than a specific uh, situation that we were in or a car, or, you know, driving around with someone else, and you know those types of uh, loving type of things. I think of the studio and that. You know, it was, uh, I remember how difficult it was doubling this particular part or, you know, something like that. And we finally got it and I was never satisfied. And then when I listened to the record, I went, you know, it sounds pretty good. I, you know, I, I'm always my own worst critic. And, uh, you know, I, I think a lot of us are, are the same way where we, you know, I, I could be better. I could be better. Can we do it again? And then you're out of time. And no, you can't do it again. You're done. I threw in that eight track reference just for you too, because not many people yeah. in the in my newsroom. If I say eight track, people say, "What are those things?" Are but that our generation, I remember those. I was so shocked that, and every time I listened to it, even though I knew it was coming, when a song would start fading out, I, I went, that, you know, like there was always something wrong right away. And then yeah. the, the insult to injury was when it faded back in. Like, yeah, and then you'd have right. to then you'd have to click to the third or the fourth track to hear it un, un uh, interrupted. Yeah, I remember those days. Oh how, my God. How, that yes. was, but that was uh, cutting edge technology back then. Yeah, 
Yeah, wasn't that nice? Mm. Of all of the uh, of all of the awards that Chicago has gathered, Lee, does one mean any more than the other? I mean, Rock and Roll Hall of Fame, Recording Industry Lifetime Achievement, Star on the Hollywood Walk of Fame. There's a, a street dedicated to you in your hometown of Chicago. Does any one of those make your heart warmer than any other? They are great to get and the longer you are around the more uh apt you are to to getting awards and you know obviously we've been working through this this career uh one step at a time one gig at a time uh and and enjoying every minute of it for most of the time i mean there's the ups and downs of any career and we've been down as much as we've been up but getting the award is like the recognition that you've done something right during the course of the career and inevitably the very next day you're playing another show so it's it's great to get them they're wonderful it's like thank you very much i appreciate this a lot and then i go back to work and that's really what it is for me it's it's, it's just a a stop along the way of, of being honored and uh it's appreciated we love it and now we're back working I your mean, dad introduced know. your dad introduced you to the trumpet when you were 11. Then yeah. you played in several bands and then you joined Walt and Terry Keith and Derry sure. Ser Danny Serafine in a band that later turned out to be or turned into I guess I should say Chicago Transit Authority. Right. Can you um, can you imagine not doing this now had something changed along the way not being in this band and doing something else for a living 54 years later? I have no idea what it would be. I'd probably be a photographer or something because I, I enjoyed taking pictures. I, I mean, you'd see me back in the uh, early 70s. I was always running around with my little Nikomat camera and uh, people were saying, get that camera out of my face. So I was you know, trying to figure out how to take pictures back then without people realizing that I was doing it. And, you know, so you, you'd be uh, so that could get candid shots with a, you know, without somebody getting angry at me. It's a difficult process, but you can figure it out. So if there is something, it's probably photography that I would have uh, done. And uh, I'm thankful that I've never had to get a job, really. <laughs> and there's a, as you know, there's a lot of work to doing this stuff that we do because you're constantly moving. You started in Scranton, you know, you've moved to many different places. And now, where are you now? Wilmington, North Carolina. I knew that Pennsylvania <laughs> to Florida to North Carolina and each one of my children were born in different places Jonathan was born in Gainesville Monica was born in New Bern Abby was born in Wilmington and your right. family kind of like the same thing right yeah well my family was always born in the city because I was always moving to go to the people because the people aren't going to come to my hometown so I had to travel to go see them as we are doing right now and uh, so the kids were all born in L.A., you know, and uh, except for my uh, my 18 year old son, he was born in, in uh, Arizona. So, no, actually, I'm sorry, he was born in California, too. Then we moved to to uh, Missouri and now we're in Arizona. That's right. He was born in California. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll edit. I'll edit that part out. Don't have to worry about that. Uh, <laughs> I can remember I can remember the first newscast I ever did. Can you take me back to the first time you heard a Chicago Transit Authority song on the radio? Uh, by the time it came on the radio, uh, it was probably Make Me Smile, and we were already Chicago by then. It, the, it was from the album Chicago, the, the Chicago Transit Authority. Uh, but it, we were... And the liner notes of the album, we changed the name to Chicago. And that's why the second album was called Chicago. And now it's called Chicago 2. Uh, but the first album was Chicago Transit Authority, second album Chicago. And subsequently, each album after that, they were all called Chicago. And the bookkeeping department had to, to differentiate the albums from one another, had to put the numbers on them. So all of a sudden, it started looking like an encyclopedia. <laughs> yeah. What was it like to hear that first song on the radio? I don't remember it being, you know, I knew 
that it was already edited. I had heard the edit before, whereas Jimmy Panko had not heard the edit. And he was shocked because instead of bum, 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 coming on the radio, he heard do, uh, do, do, do. children play went right into the first verse. There was right. no build up. There was no introduction. And he was excited beyond all get out. And uh, I'm, I'm happy I wasn't with him because he rolled all the windows down. With, it's Chicago. It's me on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> I can imagine the pure joy. Uh, yeah. It's still amazing to me. And, and I, uh, I following the band for so many years, I knew that how successful you'd become. But when I look this up, the run you guys had in the 70s, Chicago 2 peaked at number four. Chicago 3 peaked at number two, and then from 71 to 77, you went number one, number one, number one, number one, number one, number three, number six. How do you explain that kind of success? I can't. It just happens. I mean, it was, uh, you know, if you, when you heard a lot of interviews with the Beatles, then they had no idea it was going to happen. I'm just finding out now as a result of this new uh, documentary that's coming out. I just read today that without Paul McCartney, they would have only done a couple albums and been done with it. They were The other guys were happy with what they had done already, the first couple records. And McCartney kept saying, hey, boys, let's come in and uh, you know, let's hit the studio and play some. You know, and uh, so one after another, they did it. And that was still only seven years. And we've been doing it 55. So, man. <laughs> yeah, but that, that run of success, the public accepted you. Yes. How long did it take maybe for you to weed out the critics and not care what maybe the critics said? Because a lot of people had difficulty when you put horns with rock and roll, they were like, this is never going to work. You guys right. proved that it worked. You invented the sound more or less, but the right. critics didn't always praise it. And how long did it take for Lee and James and everybody else to basically say, we don't care what the critics say? Well, I'm not sure how long it took everyone else, but uh, the first album, we were the darlings. First album, from the second album on, I think we were still pretty cool with the critics on the second album third album started going downhill and never came back with the critics. Uh, and when I would, when I would see the uh, uh, critical analysis of our shows, you could tell some of these guys were not even at the show because they had the songs wrong. The, the, the song list was incorrect. You know, so you know, this guy probably wasn't even there. Right. He's probably wanting to be a novelist, but he was assigned to a rock and roll show. <laughs> so he had, he had to go do something he didn't even want to be at. And but that's when I started seeing that that if we got a good review, it was like too good. We weren't that good. And if it was a bad review, it was too bad. So they were taking this critical analysis a little too far. And I stopped reading the the uh, critics at, at all. I stopped reading it from then on. I haven't I don't read them anymore. Well, the public and, is really your boss anyway. Right. The public is the one who decides. Exactly. whether you're good or not and when we play those shows we're good every night and that's all i need and that's all i need to know so it's you know thank you very much for being here for us and enjoying it we try to make it better as good as we possibly can every night and that's our job i love it well this may be unfair to ask but i'm going to ask it anyway in the vast archive of chicago songs is there one that maybe you did not think was going to be a hit that turned into a smash? And conversely, is there one that you thought was going to be, oh man, this is number one material that maybe didn't do as well as you thought? I thought Explain It to My Heart was going to be a huge success, as some of the other ballads had already been. And But that was at a point where radio had decided that they were already playing enough Chicago records and it was time for, I guess, a younger uh, genre to come in and take over the airwaves and because they kept telling us we're already playing Chicago since so we know that this is the new song come on and uh, but explain it to my heart never made it and I thought it would have and should have 
Can you explain the feeling of maybe hearing the lyrics or he hearing the melody of a song and going, oh, this is going to be good. This is going to be like maybe the number, any of your number one songs. Did one of those just go, hey, guys, this is, this is solid? You can only hope because you never know what's, what's going to hit and what, what isn't. It's, uh, um, you write it and record it and put it out there and see what happens. And, and then it's up for you and everyone else to decide if that's going to work. Is it a hit or a miss? You actually wrote a song that reached number one on the AC charts, Call yes. On Me, in 74. Right. right. I don't think I realized that it reached number one until years later. It, it reached number six on the, the top 100. Right. So that was more impressive to me than, than anything else. And, you know, that was the easy listen, the, the top, the, that uh, number one, which is great. You know, I mean, that was my first song and it was uh, it was a hit record. So uh, but for me, being that that critic that wouldn't get off my own back, I still never thought it was good enough. You know, and it is. I look back on it now. And go, it sounds pretty good. I mean, they're I, awesome. I'm I like saw, a two under, you know, I saw an interview that you did and you talked about how difficult the road is and this industry is the first two sports directors I ever worked under were both divorced and you've talked openly about the difficulties of having personal lives in the industry that you're in. Have you yeah. come to grips with 54 years in this industry that you had to sacrifice some things years later? Yes. yes. And also I have a relationship with all five of my kids of uh, four specifically and the the fifth one has just come back into my life and you know it's it's pretty cool because you know uh, i'm sure they heard a lot of things from the now ex-wives that that weren't uh all in my favor and they, they've been able to grow up and see uh either through seeing the documentary or just see you know meeting you know when we get together they understand who i am now and and um accept me as I am and vice versa. And does now, is that at mid seventies, does that mean more to you than maybe oh, yeah. all of um, all of the awards put together? Definitely. Family first, and it's always been difficult to, to maintain that because I'm always gone. And it's hard to explain why. I know we're getting tight on time here, but I want to talk a little bit about the project where you're taking everybody back to Carnegie Hall in 1971. This was part of a live record many years ago, but you're putting the entire eight nights out on CD as one project, right? It was six nights, eight shows. We did two, two a night uh, for the, the last two, two nights. We did one, they called it the matinee and it started at eight o'clock p.m. Right. <laughs> and then we did the, the uh, second show at midnight. For, so, so two nights running, we were up all night anyway. Right? And we're, we're, what did we care? We were 21 years old, 22 years old at the time. And, uh, uh, but it was fun to do. And when I look back on Carnegie Hall now, it was, it was a series of six nights in between shows that we had done previously, uh, a tour that was ongoing, and then Carnegie Hall was six nights. And then right after Carnegie Hall finished, we flew back to California, had probably a day off and started working again on, you know, the continuation of the tour, wherever we were, we were playing next. And uh, so for us, we didn't hear the album until it was mixed and mastered. We were busy working. We had, we didn't go into the studio at all and hear what was happening. Uh, so, and it was a compilation of, of only one of the eight shows. And when Rhino came to, to me and Tim Jessup to do this project, they wanted all eight shows. And no one has heard that before. And with the technology, the way we have it now, we were sonically able to put the listener in a seat in Carnegie Hall. And you can imagine that you're sitting there watching and listening to the band play. So it was, it was really cool for me to do that. And this is on an album 
that we didn't think was all that good when we first did it. You know, we were we were upset with how it ended up sounding. And even then it sold a million when you said, you know, we, we can't, that was during the period where we couldn't do any wrong. <laughs> Everything we did was golden. And, uh, but, and so we sold a million copies of that and it still lives on today. People t tell me that they love listening to, they wore it out when they were listening to Carnegie Hall they over and over and over again. And now they have all eight shows to listen to. So, and well, they hear it better too. <laughs> Well, I, I can tell you, I wore out many an eight track of Chicago in that 73 Camaro of mine. So I'm right there with many of your fans. Well, uh, you still have your eight? No, I th no, the eight track, the eight tracks are in a box, I think, in, in my mom's house somewhere. Uh, and, but they probably that quality of tape is probably still around, along with all the cockroaches from back then, too. <laughs> That's um, right. I've, I've got to ask. When somebody tells you that your music is the soundtrack of their lives, what does that do for you? It makes you want to work harder. Really? Yeah. Yeah, because, uh, you know, we never thought that that would happen. You're, you know, when you first uh, record records and, or write songs, you don't know if, if it's going to last or or not be a hit or a miss. And uh, we've had so much success that when people say that to us, it's like, man, with, uh, you know, I, because we're going to keep playing these songs every night. And when they come to hear us, they're going to expect it to be as good as what they remember. And in order to do that, you got to practice. This stuff does not get easier from night to night. You got to, I, I was practicing, I was just warming up before we started the interview. And uh, I'm going to get back to it because I have a show tonight and uh, I'm going to try to be as good as I can. And that's the only way you got to put that horn in your face and, and work at it. Well, I know you appreciate the audiences more now than you did back then. True. Yeah, definitely. Definitely. And uh, because, as you said, if we if I wasn't doing this, what would I be doing? And I still have no idea. But now because of the pandemic. <laughs> I built the studio where I am, which is where we uh, produced the, the uh, Carnegie Hall project. So I know where I'm going to be after this ends. And so far, it's not ending. We're not going anywhere anytime soon. Well, I, uh, myself, my wife, and about uh, several thousand of our closest friends are going to be watching you and the rest of the band. The show is Tuesday night. October the 12th at the Live Oak Amphitheater in downtown Wilmington. Lee Lockdown, I can't tell you how much I've enjoyed this conversation. I know your time is limited, or I would keep you on this call all day long and just talk <laughs> rock and roll songs with you. Thank you for your time, and on behalf of tens of millions of other people, thank you for 50-plus years of Chicago music and being the soundtrack to all of our lives. Thank you very much. It's been great being here. A big thank you to Lee Lochname for sparing some time in between sound checks to join us for this week's podcast interview. Hope you can get to see the band Chicago live in downtown Wilmington at the Riverfront Amphitheater Tuesday, October the 12th. I'll be there. Hope to see you there as well. If you can't make it, well, check out the future tour dates. Go to chicagotheband.com. You can see all of the places where they're going to play live. You can check out the band's merchandise and get all of the latest news about Lee and the other band members, too. Now, before we go, I'd like to ask you a favor. Please download and subscribe to the One-on-One -on -One with John Evans podcast on whatever app you use to listen to your favorite shows. And if you would be so kind, please leave us a rating or a review. I really do want to know what you think about our interviews, and the more feedback we have from folks like you, the higher we'll be listed on the apps, the better chance we'll have of bringing in even more new listeners. I'm John Evans. Thanks so much for joining us for this episode of One on One.